Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everyone, we will be continuing on our module on pigment and we have been talking mostly about the use of mineral pigment in form of murals and uh, other ways of decorating the uh, architecture as well as sculpted surfaces. Now, with this that I mean how we have looked into the uh, caves of uh, Elora, we find that I mean similar kind of activities were not just uh, those kind of activities were not just limited to um, the sites of this rock uh, shelters or these caves, but they were also been included in the in the temples. So, for example, we have one of the uh, temples from the uh, eighth century, and that is Kailash Natha or Kailash Natha Temple in Kanchipuram, and uh, that is one of the temples what we find from eighth century that had remnants of these paints or the pigments from eighth century. So this is a temple. Why we study this particular temple is because um, this this temple was almost left intact even by the people who came to rule these places later on. For example, the Cholas or the Vijayanagara uh, dynasty and so on and the Nayakas and that is the reason we still have some of the remnant of this 8th century pigments in the temple left. So, what we have here, I mean again we will not be looking into the, looking too much into the architectural um, structure of this temple, but we will be looking more into how um, the images are there and how architecture and painting and sculptures, they all were related closely. So, this is a temple that we find it was made in uh, the city of Kanchipuram, which was also the capital city of the Pallava dynasty who were ruling there between 7th and 8th centuries. So, uh, the, in Kanchipuram we see this temple being dedicated to Lord Shiva and uh, who is also known as Kailash Nathar. And so, here what we have that there are all those uh, around the main shrine, uh, there are also there are many of the shrines which sort of um, in, in circle or which which surround the entire uh, temple complex. So, if there is a rectangular temple complex we can think about, then the rectangular temple complex is surrounded by the smaller shrines or the cells. And in this cells, we can see that all these cells had uh, lime plasters and in some of the cells in the deeper recesses of these cells like the niches, we have sculpted images and then those sculpted images were also painted with lime plaster as well as with paint. So, all these images that we find here in this um, in this temple complex, they, they are the ones we, which usually come from these recessed areas and also some of the ones which come from the interior of these temples. So, for example, the one we have in the right side of the uh, of the screen and that is uh, one image where we find there is a image of Lord Vishnu and uh, who is identified with uh, his uh, very characteristic um, the conch shell or Shankha and then of course the um, you know the, the the Sudarshana chakra and so what we find here that I mean how the Lord the image of Lord Vishnu is there with all the iconographic details and we have already discussed the, um, the importance of the iconographic conventions and how they have been very much ingrained in making these murals whether those are Buddhist murals, Jaina murals or Hindu murals. So, we find that I mean perhaps this is a narrative scene in which uh, Shiva and Parvati's marriage is uh, facilitated by Lord Vishnu. In southern India, Lord Vishnu is considered to be Parvati's brother and that is the reason we also find that I mean how he had also played a very important role in this uh, Shaiva narratives. 
So here we see that I mean how uh, the the importance of the line if you see some of the characteristic features of this image how the importance of the line has been grown much more from the images that we have seen earlier. Now here we do not really see the lines are uh, varying in depth for example if we see the uh, contour lines of his body or his uh, arms and so on. But the thing is that I mean the lines are much more sort of uniform but they are seamless, they are flowing, they are rhythmic and these are the, all the lines which also are the lifeline of these images. So we have the contour lines which are drawn with a much more darker tone and then there are the other details which perhaps are being drawn with little lighter uh, uh, colors. So if um, a tone like dark umber or brown that is used for um, making the contour lines as well as the ornaments and so on, then for details and for, for tonal variation we find that I mean the lighter tones for example this earthy red and uh, lighter tones of brown and so on those are the ones which are used. Now we also see that the, uh, the use of tonal variation those we have uh, been addressing in the, uh, in, in the images in Ajanta and then to certain extent in the cave paintings of Elora the way we have looked into this Jaina figure those are the ones which are have been reduced further in this images. So here in terms of like the tonal variation we see that there are very slight hint of this for example there if there is a contour line and then right beside the line there will be another uh, almost like I mean a patch uh, a light patch of a lighter tone that will be uh, situated there and which which uh, does not give the tonal variation this the smooth tonal variation that uh, used to uh, there be there in the in the images of Ajanta and so on but it seems to be moving towards a different kind of um, image making practice where different priorities were there. So for example here we also find how the ornaments and the use of the lines in these ornaments have also been grown much more from what we have seen in the images of Ajanta and so on. So perhaps the importance in these images that stayed with line and all these intricacies uh, as opposed to um, you know as, as opposed to uh, providing this three dimensional quality in these bodies. Now the other thing if we, uh, if we are uh, comparing these images we, we can also imagine that how um, um, you know cert certain kind of characteristic features for example how the slight bent of his head or um, this Trivanga posture that we have already discussed in terms of the uh, Bodhisattva Padmapani. So similar kind of postures and, and the body gestures and so on those are also something they have been here. So a theme which we have addressed in the earlier module that how certain kind of architectural forms or sculptural forms are not really uh, exclusive to one religion but several religions which are growing side by side. So that is also something we can find in terms of this painting traditions as well that how certain ideas for example this, this idea of the beauty idea about like this ideal body types which are usually been associated with the uh, deities or the god figures those are the ones and then of course that how to represent a, a godly figure with, in, in this very rhythmic and elegant tribhanga posture and so on all these ideas we find they are also not been exclusive to one particular form of painting but they have been there across religions almost around the similar time period. So it also suggests that there must have been an exchange of the knowledge between the painters who were painting in the cave temples as well as in these temples and the, um, the cave sites. So this also tells us about that I mean even though we are talking about 6th century AD or 8th century, 9th century the correlation between these uh, geographical areas were perhaps been there. It is uh, the idea about knowledge sharing and how to do painting and how to apply paint or like how to emphasize the use of lines these things were also communicated between the, um, the painters, the artisans something we see 
uh, in our um, uh, in our practice even today. So from there, I also wanted to draw attention to one of those painted niches or those painted shrines in which we see that how the there are the layers of the paint and the layers of this lime plaster that actually gives us a sense of how this temple might have been constructed when it was made in the 8th century. So here there is this niche in the Kailashnatha temple which shows um, Shiva and Parvati and uh, here we see that I mean the the majestic and the monumental images of Shiva and Parvati, they are seated in the center stage and um, they are been carved out of the uh, uh, of the stone and there are also other figures who, who are been there in the background. Uh, so, we see that there are the attendant figures or perhaps the, um, the divine figures who are, who are been there in the background and uh, all of them are uh, absolutely either paying their homage or greeting the, the central deities and they are Shiva and Parvati. Now, what we also see here that uh, how this painted image, I mean these sculptures who uh, are being carved and they, they have the basic characteristic features of both these figures and then I mean the, there is also uh, an importance of how the, the gesture and the, the, the posture and everything else have been also there in the iconographical convention. However, for adding the additional details or the finer details, we see that there is a high degree of reliance on the, um, the painted imagery. So, on the top of this sculpted image, the lime plaster was added and parts of the lime plaster we can see in this all these different areas. So, the lime plasters were added on the top of it and then on the top we find that perhaps only after the lime plaster was completely dry, then the layers of paint were added on the top of it. So, we can imagine that I mean in some cases we have the, the remnants of the paints. For example, here we see how um, you know there, there are some of the, uh, the yellowish paints which are there. So, both Shiva and Parvati, they are perhaps been shown as the fair skinned ones and that is the reason we see that I mean this yellowish paints are there in their body. However, here in the depiction of of the textile, we find that multiple colors are perhaps been used in different parts to show how the textile surface is different from the skin of these deities. So, this kind of strategies of combining this uh, sculpted forms with the painted uh, with painted imagery, this is this is something we find that it, it was also there all across in the um, in various parts of the Indian subcontinent and that that also tells us about that how many of the images as I have already mentioned before that many of these sculpted images and parts of the architecture that we see in the museums or in various collections today even though they do not have remnants of paints they were mostly in most of the cases they were painted. So, the use of the pigments, the mineral based pigments as I have uh, we, we have been uh, talking about, the use of the mineral based pigments were much more expansive than what we see them today. So, this use of the mineral based pigment and this um, and uh, the tradition of painting on the top of the, um, the sculpted surface or on the, on the top of the architecture is something that we see that I mean that was uh, there during this, this time period at least this Kailashnatha temple from 8th century that suggests how this tradition persisted in 8th century in Tamil Nadu or in the southern India and that is something we still see today that how some part of this tradition or like some part of this uh, habitual practice is still continuing in um, southern India. So, for example, here we have uh, a painted porch Gopura and that is from the Thyagaraja temple from Tiruvarur uh, in Tamil Nadu and it was made between like 12th and 13th century and here we have um, this painted Gopura or the entrance gateway to this temple complex. So, the idea of painting the, um, the exterior walls of the temples and also like I mean covering them 
working with lime plaster then adding individual colors to uh, indicate the different deities the divine forms the semi divine forms and um, the human beings this is a practice that we see that it has its roots in the uh, history and that is also something that is still being continued even today so this is also a reminder for us that how the use of the pigments uh, that something that we uh, perhaps that I mean the lime plastered walls and the use of these pigments it is not always the most viable thing to survive for the weather conditions and so on but such kind of traditions of painting them annually for example how the um, the temple gopuras and so on they are either painted annually or after an interval of uh, a particular interval of time so this kind of traditions also suggest that how uh, this this uh, the use of the paints and so on that that had been there in the past was was uh, usually being renewed with each uh, ritualistic purposes so this is also something that tells us about the correlation between the historical practices and something that happens in the contemporary times and it is also a reminder for all of us that I mean this use of the pigments and the use of the paints that's something that we are studying from the second century BC and so on is not something that is completely disconnected from the living practices that we see around us even today. Now one perhaps uh, imp uh, the, the difference we might find in terms of the use of the colors today that there are many places in, uh, in this uh, or like there are many sites or the temples that we have here uh, for example the one we have on screen in this kind of cases we see that there are uh, more and more the use of this synthetic colors or the industrial colors which are which are now being prioritized more than the mineral based colors that's because the mineral based colors and the lime plasters they wash away with every rain so in the monsoon they will perhaps be washed away so to avoid those kind of issues we see that I mean how the waterproof colors are being used today however that the, uh, the way in which the colors are used and, uh, and painting each and every deities and the other forms in this uh, architecture and sculpted uh, areas so that is the, the practice of using colors on the surfaces is something that makes us think about their correlation to this historical um, objects and monuments so from there I just wanted to come back to uh, this comparison or at least the correlation between this uh, the images that, that we have already studied. So for example if we see the images of um, Ajanta and uh, the one we have on screen that is uh, Bodhisattva Padmapani uh, and uh, the way in which we can see or we have discussed the idea of tonal variation the way we have also discussed the use of lines that how the use of the subtle uh, the uh, subtle lines as well as the lines which vary in their depth all those kind of features and how that gets um, you know transformed into into this uniform lines in uh, some of the uh, murals in the other parts of the Indian subcontinent. So for example uh, if we compare this uh, Pallava uh, mural from the Kailashnatha temple with the um, you know the ones in Ajanta. So there we see that how similar kind of colors and similar kind of this um, the, the gestures, postures and the movement of the hand and so on all those things have been employed but at the same time if we also see how the similar pigment is treated very differently for creating a different kind of visual effect is, is there that, that also marks their individuality. So as I have already mentioned earlier that these are the images from which we cannot really make a value judgment of whether one thing is better than the other but here we need to understand that I mean how there were different kind of priorities the priorities can be in terms of what the, the patrons had their requirement about or it can also be the artisan or the artist's choice but 
these priorities were also there in terms of how these images were constructed and how we see them and we read them today. Now, even when we talk about all the similarities and differences, it's also very important for all of us to think that, I mean, the kind of materials which were used for painting both the surfaces that we have on screen, they were very similar. The way we have already mentioned it at the outset of this um, module or this week, that how the similar kind of minerals and the pigments, those were used from the, the rock shelters of Bimbetka to, to the medieval paintings as well as the early modern and then uh, something that had happened perhaps very most recently. So, similar kind of this mineral based colors for example, as we see here the green earth and then perhaps here red oxide and some kind of like umber color which might have some remnant of um, you know which might have some uh, element of manganese and, and iron in them. So, this kind of this mineral based colors which are there and even here we see the use of similar kind of green earth and this earthy red and so on. So, this these are the colors that we find that I mean they, they, they remained almost similar in most of these murals and these paintings all across the Indian subcontinent, but their priority like I mean the way in which they were uh, you know they are applied onto the wall surface and then of course very importantly how the lines were drawn with this darker tones that made a whole lot of difference and that is how we find how one image is distinguished from the other and with the sim same material how different kind of visual expressions are created, different kind of emotions were evoked and of course, the different kind of skills were displayed. So, from there I just wanted to wrap up the, um, the entire uh, session on what, what we have uh, spoke about so far and all of them are certainly around the use of pigments. So, if we start some of the, some, if, we, if we go back to some of the issues that we have addressed in the beginning. So, for example, how this, this red pigment is used in the, in the cave sites of Bimbetka and then we have also addressed that how there are some of those superimposition like here and what that suggests. Like for example, if there are one community or if there is one group who, uh, who paint or like who draw one image and then in the later times we find that how those images are superimposed by someone else and by doing that they do not remove the, the earlier surface, but they add to this. This is a very, uh, this is this is a way in which we find that how the history and the layers of a different kind of practices they coexist. So, this is also a practice we do not really see them being uh, evident in all the mural practices or all the painted surfaces in India, but we also see that I mean in many cases this kind of coexistence of uh, the paintings or the painted surfaces from different time periods, they, they appear side by side in these various monuments and architectural sites. Now, the other thing we also find that how uh, the there are uh, even though like I mean the similar kind of colors are used, but perhaps some of the additive materials or perhaps some kind of polishing techniques those are also employed on the surface for adding to the visual effect of them. So, for example, the kind of um, the finesse that we find in the cave temples or the, or the caves of Sittanavasal that, that we have here, it was perhaps uh, even though like I mean similar um, mineral based colors like the green earth or terra verde and then um, this red oxide and uh, the yellow pigments and so on, those are the ones which are used. But it is also possible that for Sitanavasal as well as for Ajanta, the, the, uh, the surface, the lime plastered surface were polished and they were treated in, in particular ways for which like I mean they were, they became much more receptive to the, the mineral based colors which were applied on the top of them. 
and that is also something that we find that why these images have become much more uh, sophisticated in their in their visual presence and the the result the the uh, final outcome of of this entire painted painting process that that became starkly different from the ones that we see in the cave sites of Bimbetka and so on. So, these are some of the ways in which we can imagine that how different kind of techniques were involved even though similar kind of materials were there. Another thing that we also can imagine that how the tools of painting were also been very much important part of all these images. So, if we can think about that how a crayon like uh, um, material like for example, if I am thinking about a block of red oxide or um, a piece of charcoal which is used as a crayon and then it was used for drawing onto the cave surface. So, if that is the kind of application of color that was evident in the cave sites of Vimbetka as well as in Jogimara and places like that, then we see the application of color became drastically different when there was incorporation of brush. For example, when we see the images in Ajanta or in Sitanavasal, we know that this the images were not really drawn with a crayon like surface or not something that is crude, but it was much more sophisticated and the layers of paints or the layers of this pigment based paints were applied onto this wall surface with the help of different kinds of brushes. So, we from very early times we see that I mean how different kind of animal hairs like the goat's hair or the squirrel's hair, those are the ones which are used for making different brushes of, of the varying thickness. So, that is something we find that how they also makes a huge deal of difference in terms of how the visual impact of them are created. So, if these are some of the issues we see in terms of that this, this difference in or the similarities between techniques, material and so on. And that is also something for us to think about that how certain this overall practices of painting and painting onto architecture or painting onto the sculptures that is something that had been there from very early period in the Indian subcontinent and that is something we can see in the Kailashnathar temple and of course, I mean in the other places for example, in Ajanta, Elora and so on. The last thing I would say that I mean even though there is always been a thrive towards uh, understanding that how Vimbetka paintings are much more cruder or much more archaic in their style and Ajanta paintings or the paintings in Sittanavasal and so on, they are much more refined in their uh, appearance. But we can imagine that I mean it is not really a way in which a linear progression could take place because similar uh, the, the images that we find in Vimbetka, we see their resonance in many of the other wall paintings we see even today in the contemporary times. For example, the Gond painting, the Worli painting and so on in which stick like figures and very uh, minimal material those are employed for painting onto this wall surfaces. So, it can be uh, uh, it can be imagined that the painting style like Bimbetka and the painting style of Ajanta they might have coexisted in the history, but in different pockets. So, if there are much more skilled artisans and group of people who are patronized by the royals and so on, they must have been uh, they must have preferred the way in which more sophisticated ways of visual depiction were there. Whereas, the uh, the groups we which uh, prioritized uh, simple forms of expression with minimal materials and so on, they must have opted for the, the, the figures that we see in the context of Bimbetka and so on. Thank you.